As the next speaker comes to the podium, I think it, it's worth reminding ourselves that the Guyanese nation is not all resident in our 83,000 square miles. And some of the reality that comes with that reality is the fact that some of the issues, challenges, pathologies of the homeland are reflected in the diaspora. And we are going to have to find a way to not only focus on the intentionality of doing something conversation plus in Guyana, but the reality is that there is an interface between what happens on land with beyond land called the land of Guyana. I say this to say that I am hopeful that members of the diaspora who are following us online, who will look at the video subsequent to the live webcast, also would want to feel compelled to be not in the zone of lamentation, but also in the zone of intentionality to do something positive. Not something positive to represent your definition of your own, but with a view to enabling Guyana, which is not one unit, one race, but of many. Please, members of the diaspora who are following us, commit to helping us to live what Rabindranath Tagore said. Cannot cross the sea simply by standing and staring at the water. Please help me welcome the next lecturer, the next speaker, Mr. Colin Klautsky. Upakoma, greetings in the language of the Carib Nation. I want to advise you, um, I joined the Guyanese Organization of Indigenous Peoples in 1990, 28 years ago. One ob objective of joining is to learn the Carib language, which is my mom's ancestry from Region 7. Unfortunately, I only know five words. <laughs> Upakoma, which means greetings. Apatoa, which means teacher, Yuperterde means queen, Natare means princess, and Iniko means something special. Um, and I wish to advise you, um, it was mentioned time, seven minutes. We all know indigenous Guyanese have a different interpretation somewhat of time and distance. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> They may be tempted to say the distance between Temeri Airport and Pegasus Hotel is just half an hour walking. <laughs> so therefore, just don't be, um, you have an idea. However, I will try my best to stick to the seven minute time limit as we know it, not indigenous seven minutes. Um, and we appreciate being invited to this um, particular event because I have to say, there's not many entities really appreciate what indigenous people have to say. In some cases, they're sort of scared of what they have to say, and they prefer they don't say anything, maybe remain docile. Um, we wish that the organization, GOIP, we've discussed this issue of ethnicity, race, at several of our meetings. Um, and my presentation, by the way, is going to be more like village language. This university degree, technical language, is something I'm not very comfortable with. So I would say something like, I, I speak in a way that Auntie Bucky walking, washing clothes by the landing can understand what I'm saying, right? Um, however, I have to say, if you're speaking anthropologically, planet Earth, as the anthropologist says, divided into Australoid, Cossacide, Negroid, and Mongoloid races. Now, in this regard, 
If you were to follow this, Guyana would have three races, namely Negroite, two, two brands of Cossessoid, and a, there's a tremendous dispute as to how many, sorry, two brands of, brands, strands of Mongoloid and two or three groups of Cossessoid. Um, apparently, there's a fine line between the two types of white Guyanese, the, those who, the Madeira and indentured workers, and those who came as planters, essentially the same people. We are probably gonna hear descendants of Madeirans denying that, that you know, their, their, their ancestors were indentured workers and they should be white Guyanese like planters. And in any case, that, that segment seems to be facing extinction somewhat. So we have a difficulty in having two different white Guyanese groups in Guyana, but again, that's a little, you know, something to debate. Guyana's original inhabitants would fall under the, a specialized Mongoloid classification that would have evolved on the American continent for thousands of years. Through what the scientists would say, a process of specialization through natural selection. Um, this would mean our ancestors can claim no homeland outside of the 83,000 square miles that is Guyana's space. Now, issues. There are many, many issues that affect indigenous Guyanese, very serious issues. And you wouldn't tell that these issues exist when you go to Indigenous Heritage Month celebration because the objective is to give the idea that, oh my goodness, everything is so right with these people. The, 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 the romantic village setting is there, they have giant life and so on, but I could tell you nothing could be further from the truth, right? We have issues of human trafficking affecting our people. And I have to say, Ethnic profiling, remember I'm using the word ethnic, not racial, profiling of indigenous females is quite widespread in this. We have issues of dom domestic violence. We have issues of labor exploitation. And we have taboo issues like incest in the villages that people don't like to talk about. If, if I get up and raise this point, even at a village meeting, we say, hey, we ain't talking about that man. That's the next time. I've tried this several times in my community at Malali to say, you know, what are we doing to deal with an issue like this? Oh, you can talk to them. Are you related to so so so, so here? And, and, and your cousin and, and cousin, it's a cousin, cousin make dozens and so on. And, and these, these things tend to, you know, put, um, sort of entrench a, a very ancient cultural practice. And the missionaries came and said, no, that is pagan and, and we need to change these things. Um, However, as an ethnic group, right, a very serious unresolved issue remains land rights. It has been simmering for the past five decades, nonstop, and despite well-meaning well efforts, such as the UNDP, the UNDP rep is here, they did play a big role in um, supporting a land titling project, ALT. The process continues, but it's continuously frustrated. And we have had retrogressive developments such as the Isenro court decision, which in effect said a gold miner can actually go and mine an in indigenous reservation. Fortunately, uh, that, that um, decision is being appealed. I can't quite tell you the status of it right now. And um, we've had lots of issues concerning land and um, land inquiry, commission of inquiry and these sort of things. And, in other words, a sort of a divorce, diversion from what our national indigenous hero, Mr. Stephen Campbell, was fighting for uh, before Guyana changed its flag in, the, in 1966, that's six, uh, 51 years ago. Um, and then we have the unresolved Upper Mazaruni court case. It's been pending for two decades now. I'm beginning to wonder which country really um, would have a court case pending for two decades. Um, we're not getting success stories on the land rights issue in court decisions. We would like our people to learn more about the Mabo decision in Australia 1993, which in effect, I'm not a liar, in effect said that the first people of Australia do indeed own the, the entire continent, as well as its subsurface mineral rights. Australia and Guyana being two Commonwealth countries, that decision ought to have um, implications for us in Guyana here. Um, we would like to educate our people about this. Unfortunately, most indigenous Guyanese know nothing about this, this court decision. 
A more recent one was held in Belize, the Toledo Maya people, descendants of one another court decision, which in effect is very similar to Mabo decision, right? So we're finding outside of Guyana, Commonwealth CARICOM countries are, are having success stories, but Guyana is not happening here in Guyana. Despite this uh, propaganda that's, that's portrayed, that, oh, we have an indigenous ministry, so therefore we care more about indigenous people than so many other part, parts of the world. I could say nothing could be further from the truth, right? Having a ministry doesn't solve the issue. And, you know, we, we need to change the, sort of amend the, the functions of this ministry to be more decentralized. We have indigenous people having to come to the city. It's extremely expensive to have issues resolved. And, um, you know, we have people sitting in the office there. They live in the urban areas so long, they're scared of snake and marabonta bite and these things. And they don't really want to go back to the interior to look, look at issues. So we have these sort of people, I hate to say this, but I've come across actual cases like this, working in the indigenous ministry and, and not really inclined to go work in the interior areas. Um, another issue is the, and I'm hoping I'm doing well with time, but I'm still trying to be that fall short of seven minutes. An ethnic group, um, uh, we have tremendous disadvantages with regard to the healthcare system and education system. This is a very tragic reality, and, and people living on the coast don't seem to know or not tremendously interested in what's happening, but it is. Now, I can talk from my own little experiences as a little boy and more recently um, at a workshop at my home community, Malali. I've experienced several marimontas things. I've experienced a piranha bite. I've experienced vampire bites. I have to say, vampire bat bites, and they, they, they can really um, take at least, a, at least a pint of blood out, out to you at one. You know, for those who donate blood, they get an idea how, how much a pint is at, at one bite. Um, we found that in the communities, the systems to look after issues like this are generally inadequate, right? They're non-existent. We do depend on some bush doctors some, and, and these sort of persons, the older people, to solve it, but they're facing extinction too, you see? The culture generally is dying, including the, the um, medicine men and medicine women, PI men, PI women, etc. It's all fading away. Um, all right, I'm not gonna go to for education. I have a little experience as a school teacher. I have to say, um, Oh my goodness, I'm trying to think of a success story anywhere in the interland. It seems to be so just non-existent. The schools are in really terrible shape. Of course, the teachers get a very low salary. Working conditions are very poor. Many schools don't have proper library facilities. You can't keep books. You see books scattered all over the place. And some cases, washroom facilities are extremely poor as well. So the natural environment for teaching and learning is just very poor, right? So this helps to explain why indigenous children tend to underperform, generally speaking. Um, and we have a system too where an urban drift has taken place. Children have to come to urban centers to attend, especially secondary school. This thing ought to change. We need more secondary schools at, at strategic clusters, strategic areas in the interior so that so as to avoid, you know, this culture shock when indigenous students have to come to cities and, and be called buck people, buck girl, buck boy, go back to the bush and those tremendous insults that they face at all times. Um, I have experienced it, I have teaching experience, um, and I've witnessed students, indigenous students, undergo these tremendous um, attempts to degrade them and, and so on. Um, I don't think I have too much long more. Um, <laughs> But this, this last point here, um, I actually have some solutions, but I'm gonna make those really brief. Has to do with the racist abuse, discrimination issues. As we all know, we're all buck people, I guess. It's supposed to be a bad word, but I'm gonna come more to that shortly. Um, and some people might be surprised to hear it's actually not a very bad word, and there's another word that is in fact a bad word. Um, in terms of solutions, 
I, I, you know, I, how I structured this, and I had a very short time to prepare this, by the way. I was only given a notice about this last night by the chief of Goethe, Mary Valenzuela. So this is all handwritten stuff, just ideas put together through the course of the day. Um, indigenous bodies, GOIP and, and others, are going to need to come together to identify very effective strategies to solve the land issue, because we're noticing Guyana's official dump or because the political divide over the last 50 years is not tremendously interested in having this issue resolved. And um, I have to say, 19 years ago, in the year 1999, GOIP and community groups in Region 9 made a decision that you're going to have a land rights walk, 1,000 kilometers, from the village of Akuto. This is a YUI community in the south of Guyana, right here to the north. Now, Please don't say that's not possible. Indigenous people are tremendous, great walkers, actually. Um, at that same time, in the other parts of South America, Ecuador, Peru, I think, there was also land rights marches. So the idea was to fall in line. You know, don't get left out of the process in Guyana here. But it was very effective. Shortly afterwards, this land titling was taking place, land demarcation was taking place. The process was being speeded up somehow. You know, so maybe this whole idea of indigenous people protesting sends shockwaves around the place. And, you know, but we would like to see, in the interest of reconciliation, compromise, and these sort of things, that ought to be a last resort. We don't want to make that as a threat, you know. Um, I, I was actually going to conclude with this, but I'm going to say it now. And we, we're not political. GYP doesn't say how high when any political party say jump, but indigenous Guyanese are the swing vote, you see? So if you're gonna PG wing, so to speak, and waste time on, on indigenous land issues and, and so on, be very careful, elections is coming up, elections are coming up, <laughs> judgment day, so to speak, and we will see who will have the last laugh, you see? Um, Anyway, I still have one, a couple few other things to say. In terms of education, the coastal communities, regions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 10, are the ones where the Waro, Carib, and Lokono language are facing the greatest threats. One solution, threats of extinction, um, is that perhaps it's not a new idea. It has been you know, spread before that these languages be included in the curriculum of the school secondary, even primary, I guess, school curriculum in indigenous communities in these, these are actually seven regions, right? Um, and the indigenous are, people are minority in all of these regions. Uh, well, with regards to Bok people, and I know some people might be tempted to laugh at this solution. It's very simplistic and laughable and naive, I guess, but we're noticing that as was mentioned by other speakers, there's no serious dialogue, no serious intent, you know, to resolve ethnic issues in Guyana. Um, and of course, we have this situation of, you know, political parties who are ethnically based, trying to actually to entrench that as election times keeps coming. But I just want to quote what the secretary of GWIP, a young woman, she was 20 years old. Uh, she participated at the Miss uh, Gold Rush pageant in Madhya, Region 8, 2012, but the press don't cover these things in Guyana. Everything then we tend to be centralized. Her statement when somebody called her a buck girl is to reply and say, thank you for telling me I can run fast, just like the wild deer, right? So please, Call me a book, I like it. Um, I have actually tried this and it works because as a school teacher too, I get a little education. I got to be educated to be a school teacher. Um, I enjoy giving this sort of response, right? I say, you're so stupid, you know, you're so ignorant, you need education. And buck is actually not a very bad word. So what you're doing, instead of insulting me, you're complimenting me. But I have to say the word Amerindian, 
There may be questions as to why GYP changed its name in 1990. Uh, that word, <laughs> actually Dr. Norton knows it quite well and several other people. It's really a misnomer. Um, you know, and the history is all, all self-explanatory. They were, the first people in the Americas were never any kind of Indians. But even worse yet, we found that outside of Guyana, if you, there, I, I know of a case where an immigration officer, in response to a passenger coming into a country, you know, some of these countries have, what race are you of? And the person said, I'm an Indian. And the immigration officer said, are you an American of Indian descent? What really is an Amerindian? You know? So basically the word has no, no water. It has no meaning outside Guyana. So it's one reason why GYP, one of our many objectives in future, is to have the word Amerindian taken out of Guyana's um, uh, constitution eventually. It's going to be a slow process, right? Um, but you know, the N word is a coarse word in, in America. So likewise, we, our position, Dr. Norton knows it quite well actually, is that the A word in Guyana with regards to the forest people would also be eventually um, extinct. Thank you very much. <laughs>